Hello everyone, and welcome to my YouTube channel. You may be thinking, Chris, isn't this the first YouTube video you've ever made? And you are correct, because this is the first YouTube video I've ever made. I'm gonna try my best to explain, at the best of my ability, space weather graphs, because do we know how to read them? Some of us do. Do you know what they are like on social media? Probably not, you probably scroll on them and be like, what? is this Chris cuz I don't know so I'm here to explain how to read them you may also be thinking Chris I have also all these Aurora apps and Facebook groups that I utilize we're gonna go through the do's and don'ts today of how to properly chase an Aurora because those apps and those Facebook groups kind of sometimes be misleading let's start off with our main space weather contributor the Sun the sun contributes coronal mass ejections, solar flares, and any other eruptions or solar wind that impacts Earth. That gives us the aurora borealis, or on the southern hemisphere, the aurora australis. Coronal mass ejections and solar flares are hard to predict, which is why we use satellites to help predict them. This coronagraph from the NASA SOHO satellite is pointed at the sun and can show CMEs and solar flares that get shot off the sun, and you can see what direction they could be going to in space. If the CME or solar flare envelops the screen, it is likely heading toward Earth. Now you may be thinking, yes, Chris, I understand something's coming to Earth, we're predicting it, but how am I supposed to predict auroras from it? Well, let's jump into it. Now, here are four graphs from a good site called Space Weather Live. You may be looking at this being like, Chris, what? the heck am I looking at? Well, let's break them down. First, on the top left, we have solar wind. Solar wind measures a stream of charged particles coming from the sun and then impacting the satellite, or in this case, Earth. On average, the solar wind stays between 250 to 450 kilometers per second, so not much to worry about here. It takes about 50-ish minutes for this data to impact Earth. But what's important for the solar wind? Higher solar wind means better chances for auroras. If you ever see this number at 550 or higher, this is a good factor into seeing auroras. Now let's talk about solar wind density in the bottom left. Solar wind density is the amount of charged particles that come from the sun. So if you have a solar flare or a CME, it releases a lot of particles from the sun and those energetic particles come into the outer atmosphere of the earth and interact. Like the solar wind data, if you have high solar densities, you have a really good chance of seeing auroras. Next up, we have the interplanetary magnetic field, and that sounds like a lot, but what does it mean? This specific graph looks at if something is impacting the magnetic field of Earth and if it's weakening the magnetic field. If this number is high, there is likely something impacting Earth and you are likely to see auroras. The last factor we have on the bottom right is the BZ factor. This factor can very much be the problem child of the four because this can determine how far south you can see the aurora borealis or australis. The BZ component is the measure of the up and down direction of something impacting Earth. If the line is green, the component is positive, which means the auroras will stay closer to the poles. If something impacting Earth is negative, the line will be red, and the auroras will go down in latitudes further. So what does this mean for sky watchers? Well, the further south the red line is, the further south the auroras will travel. Sometimes there may be a significant coronal mass ejection event, and it may be positive where the line is green, and you may be very disappointed. Sometimes the cookie crumbles that way. Here's an example where all four factors are really good. Notice how the solar wind is high, IMF is high, densities are high, and the BZ is south. This is good for high latitude and middle latitude aurora watchers. Now here's an example where I would say it's complicated. Now why is it complicated? Well, we know something is disturbed, but the solar wind is kind of weak and the BZ is pointed north, which means it's pointed more toward the poles. This is what I call the 50-50 shot of going out and seeing something. These kind of setups in the graphs I would call the waiting period, just so you can wait for the BZ to go back to negative for a while. Now you may have seen this graph online before many times, but this is the electron and proton chart from the ACE satellite. This chart helps measure particles that are coming from the sun. So if you notice a sharp rise in the bottom, which is protons, or in the top, which is electrons, there could be a possible coronal mass ejection coming from the sun. If you notice a sudden ramp up, it might be time to grab that camera and start heading out. You should also know that this is not a for sure item. CMEs can travel whatever direction they want through space. So just because you do have a proton and electron rise, 
doesn't mean that we could see an impact on Earth. The ACE satellite is also equipped with the same products as the Discover satellite. The ACE satellite can be easily found on Google. It uses the same products as the Discover satellite, but also has more variables to look through. The other variables include phi angles, temperature, and high energy protons. I would only look at these if you were really diving into auroras or space weather research. Now this last product I'll show is the WSA Enlil. This product simulates CMEs coming from the sun into space and if they will impact Earth or the yellow dot. This product can be found under the Solar Activity tab on Space Weather Live called WSA Enlil and you can just click on it and you can look through the two models there that give you a general sense if something is coming. Now I think we've covered all the basics for those graphs. Now I'm going to go through some resources and some tips, kind of like some do's and don'ts on what to do with all this information and where you might get some false information. One, go make sure to follow Space Weather Prediction Center on Facebook and or on Twitter because they give you updates and watches and warnings whenever things happen. Two, Aurora apps try their best to describe what's going on in the outer atmosphere if something is happening, but they don't give real-time data if the auroras are happening. These apps will say, oh, you have a percentage chance to see this thing right now, but... If you go outside, you can't really like do anything with that information. Three, be careful what the news says. The news loves to hype up anything that happens on the sun that impacts Earth. So make sure you get your information from the right sources and don't overhype yourself because you could get burnt out. The last option I have for you is to follow any Facebook groups that have Aurora chasers in them. I'll show you an example here. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, we have a whole bunch of groups. You can find all of these on Facebook. You just type them up and there should be leaders in the group that should let you in. Here's another example of what it's like in the Southern Hemisphere. Credit to Justin Anderson and Daniel Lamb for providing this graphic. Thank you so much for watching. I'm hoping you learned something new and I'm hoping you can catch the Aurora Borealis or Australis in the Southern Hemisphere. Safe travels and I hope you catch the lights.